little over a year ago, the world shut down. And so did the church. It was a time in history that was unprecedented. And so was mankind's ability to adapt. We've seen and experienced the faithfulness of God in the midst of uncertainty. Faithfulness that is, was, and will be consistent. Consistent. That was what we aimed to be in the past year in the middle of isolation. In our relationships with each other. In our engagement with the church. In our involvement with the community. In the growth of our faith. Because giving up is never our character. So here we go again. We are going back to Glendale First United Methodist Church for the second time around. It is happening. Save the date for our second big return. To outdoor, in-person Sunday services. On Palm Sunday, March 28th. If you would like to attend, please register at glendalefirst.org. Or call the church office at 818-243-2105. Health and safety protocols apply. So beginning Palm Sunday, you may choose between in-person or online services. We hope to see you then. We hope to see you then. We hope to see you then. When disaster strikes, we all want to help. But when days are dark, you can't always be there to show the love of Jesus to the suffering. But someone should be there. And someone is. And you are the one who makes it happen. How? By your generous giving to UMCOR Sunday. Your support enables the United Methodist Committee on Relief, UMCOR, to act as the hands and feet of Christ, embracing and supporting those in need through their darkest days. Thanks to your gift on this special Sunday of the United Methodist Church, UMCOR is able to provide relief and long-term support for recovery. Not only do we provide immediate emergency assistance in the aftermath of a crisis, we also create sustainable solutions in the following months, even years of recovery long after everyone else has gone home. Your gifts form a firm foundation, a base for operations from which UMCOR can reach and serve the hurting. Your giving enables UMCOR to keep the promise that all gifts given to help a specific cause go 100% toward meeting that need. For more than 75 years, UMCOR has met the needs of the suffering. And today, we continue that labor of love and service in 80 countries around the world. Thanks to you and your generous support through UMCOR Sunday, UMCOR will continue to be there this year to show the love of Christ to children, families, and communities when disaster strikes. Because together we do more. Lilium longiflorum. It uh, flows off the tongue, doesn't it? Lilium longiflorum. It sounds like a 1940s starlet. See here, Lilium, you're going to be a star, see? You're going to have your name in light, see? Lilium longiflorum. Sorry. Um, Lilium longiflorum, uh, more commonly referred to as the Easter lily. Now, this native flower of the southern islands of Japan might not have made its way to the States so abundantly had it not been for a World War I veteran by the name of Louis Houghton. Now, he brought home a bunch of these lily bulbs to the coast of Oregon in 1919, and he gave them to his friends to grow as a hobby. And when Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field, you surely notice their beauty, especially when they bloom like this. 
You never know about lilies. It's always risky. Promising them to be in your church on a specific day when the date of Easter changes from year to year. And Easter lilies tend to open when they want to, not when we want them to. Now, I've worshipped in churches with a chancel full of unopened lilies, and it just doesn't look right. My mom used to tell me, never go to a doctor whose waiting room plants have all died. I think it's something like that. But when you read the Easter story in the Gospels, you can just see the lilies bursting forth in full glory all over the place. You see, there's only one satisfactory ending to the Easter story, when Christ has risen for you. And that's why the ancients said, He is not yet the Christ till He be Christ for you. And I tell you, it can happen. And it happens to all kinds of people, people like you and me, people who don't even deserve it. And well, it, it feels like a lily in full bloom. That the Easter story could happen at all and continue to happen today is evidence, the, the only convincing kind, that He is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter from all of us at Chuck Nose Church.
Welcome to Glendale First United Methodist Church. I'm Reverend Chris Tate, and I'm so happy that you have chosen to be with us for worship today. It's my hope, it's my prayer, that during this time of worship that you will come to experience the presence of God more fully in your life, that you'll be able to better understand who God is and who God has created and called you to be, and then how collectively we might be able to respond to that to make Christ's difference in the world. Today is the fourth Sunday of Lent, the season that leads us up to the cross, but ultimately to Easter morning. So we are continuing on this journey with Christ, coming to better understand and appreciate who he was and who he calls us to be. In the midst of that, we are continuing to have many opportunities here at the church. Today is United Methodist Committee on Relief Sunday, where we are celebrating that UMCOR ministry, that collective ministry that enables us as a denomination to help to address disasters that there are in the world around us. And so there will be an opportunity to give to support that ministry later on in the church. We do have some other opportunities as well. We have our lunch feeding program. We have our Easter bags. We also have the opportunity to purchase Easter lilies. There's more information about that in the, the comments below. Thankfully, we are going to be able to return to outdoor in-person worship service. We're going to be able to do that on Sunday, March 28th, which is also Palm Sunday. If you would like to attend those services that we will be having, we are asking that everyone register for that. And you can find out more information about that below or on the church website as well, which is glendalefirst.org. So with all of that said, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come to this time of worship wherever that might be for us, whenever that might be for us. But we ask that you would meet us in this exact moment through the power of your Holy Spirit, that we would be able to appreciate, to feel your presence with us, to better understand and embrace the love that you have for us and for all of your people, for every person on this planet, and that we would be able to respond to respond to that love by sharing it through our words, through our actions, through our deeds, in all that we do. And we ask that that would happen and come to fruition through what happens here. It is in the mighty name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Hear our call to worship. Friends of God, believe this. God loved the world. God loves the world. We are the beloved. May the truth of this great love story shine through our worship today and renew our sense of calling. So come with your tiredness, your frustrations, and your discouragements. Come with your doubts, your fears, and your longings. Come to discover yet again how Jesus reveals God's love and mercy. Friends of God, let us worship. As we say each week, it's not being in one particular room or in one particular building for one certain hour on a Sunday morning that connects us as the body of Christ, or even as this particular body of Christ. What connects us together is our shared faith in Jesus Christ and the way that we live that out in the world. So with that, let us affirm our faith together. 
I believe in God the Creator Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Creator Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today's Gospel reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our scripture reading that we have today contains for us what is probably one of the best known scriptures in all of the Bible, that being John 3.16. But what's interesting about the scripture is that even though so many people, and probably so many of you, know it, it's not something that just fell out of the sky. Jesus didn't run down behind home plate with a rainbow wig at a Dodgers game one Sunday and raise up the sign that said John 3.16. But these words were actually spoken in a specific uh, time and place and to a specific person, and that matters 
as far as what it is that Jesus is hoping us to appreciate and to understand about this. If you begin back a little bit earlier, if you begin towards the beginning of the third chapter of the gospel according to John, you will see that a Pharisee named Nicodemus came to Jesus. He came to Jesus because he was wanting to, to know more about him, to understand. He was beginning to explore who Jesus is and what it is that Jesus was preaching and teaching about. And so it's important that we remember Nicodemus before we paint with a broad brush and say all Pharisees or all religious leaders, even of that day, were horrible, that there were those who came to Christ and uh, eventually came uh, to be followers of his. What's interesting in this story in particular is it says that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night in this time of darkness. Light and darkness are huge themes that we see throughout the gospel according to John. If you look at the beginning of John, it talks about light and the light of the world and that Jesus is this light of the world. This is relevant because according to John, the gospel according to John, that sin is different. Sin is understood in a different way. For John, it's not some moral category of behavior. It's not certain things that we do that are wrong and bad. For John, what sin is, Sin is an inability or an unwillingness to accept Jesus as Lord and God. Let me say that again. Sin is an inability or an unwillingness to accept Jesus as Lord and God, as John tells us. And so in this, John is playing on this imagery in this idea that, that Nicodemus is coming in this time of darkness that Nicodemus doesn't see. He doesn't see who Jesus is, and yet he is wanting to find out. He is wanting to discover who this Christ is. So in this moment, in this time of night, in this time of darkness, Nicodemus comes to Jesus and begins to ask him. And Jesus begins to explain, and he talks about baptism, and he talks about being born again and born from above, which is another sermon for another day. But eventually it gets to this point where Jesus says these words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Again, continuing into verse 17, Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So what is it exactly that Jesus is conveying to us? What is it that Jesus was trying to help Nicodemus and is trying to help us even today to understand about him and to understand about what it is for us to transition from that time of darkness, that time of not knowing and not understanding into a time of light, a time of awareness, a time of, of faith and living into that faith in our lives. So let's take John 3.16 and let's break it into its two parts. At the beginning of it, it says, for God so loved the world that he sent his son. It's important in this that we notice that it says, it doesn't say that God sent Jesus into the world for one particular group of people, just for Jews, just for Gentiles, uh, just for whites, just for non-whites, just for Americans, just for heterosexuals, just for any one group of people, but that God sent Jesus into the world for the world, for all of us. That's a very key and important part. And I would imagine for Nicodemus that that was in one sense empowering to hear, but also it would have been challenging for him to hear as well. As we've talked about before, the task of the Pharisees, they had a vital role in the life of the Jewish people. They were the people that helped them to follow the law. Because the law, following the law, what we have come to know as much of the Old Testament, uh, were the rules that they followed that, one, helped to differentiate them, helped to separate them out as being God's people, that made them different from the other people in the world around them. But also, it was the way in which they understood that they were connected to God and that they were in relationship with God through that. And so the people who fulfilled that role in making sure that those things happened that's good and important work. But what Jesus is saying is that, that God loves the world because of that, and so that would have been a challenge that Nicodemus would have struggled with. But then it continues in the second half of verse 16, 
and says, so that everyone who believes in him, him being Jesus, may not perish but may have eternal life. Now the struggle in this particular part of the verse is that there is an exclusive aspect. It does have this idea of belief in Jesus matters, that there's an importance in it. And according to what the text said, there's a consequence for not doing it. For me, that's the struggle that I've always had with John 3.16. And I have, and I know many other people, for most of the people I know who are not part of Christianity, who are not followers of Jesus Christ, that this idea of an exclusive God is, is a real stumbling block for them. And so let's, let's take a few minutes and deal with this. First of all, I think, I believe that there are consequences for not following Jesus, for not having faith in Jesus. The reason for that is because I believe the opposite of that is also true. I believe that there is a benefit for following Jesus. And so if there is a benefit for doing something, it would logically and rationally follow that there is a consequence for not doing it. Now that benefit, as I've seen it in my own life, is that I have experienced, it's really hard to even be able to articulate over these many years, but I have been able through the time, really in my adult life, that I've been a follower of Christ, I have been able to, at my best, let me be clear about that, at my best, have been able to have the priorities and the heart of Jesus be something I am striving for and striving to live into more than I am trying to live into my own selfish wants and desires. Now, I do not get that perfectly. I mean, one thing that being a minister does is it helps you be aware of your sin uh, more than about anything else. So, so that's the joy of this job. Um, but in the midst of that, in those moments when I am able to see that and when I am able to live into it as fleeting as they may be, it truly helps me to be a better person. It helps me to be a better person than I would have been in any other way or at any other time. And it helps me to make more of a difference, not just in my life, but in the lives of those around me, in my community, and even beyond. There's meaning in that. There's power in that. There's value in that. There's purpose in that. And to not live that way, to not live that way, even if it's just temporary or momentarily in those times and seasons of self-giving, self-sacrifice and generosity, that, that's a good thing. And so to not be devoted to that, to not ascribe to that regularly, there's a real loss that happens. I believe the world's not as good if people don't regularly do that. And I believe the more people do that, the better the world will be. If I didn't, I wouldn't be doing this job. So I believe that is a real tangible difference that we see between having faith in Christ in this world and not, and how it helps us to orient and shape our priorities and our values. I also believe in the body of Christ being together in a community of faith, seeing and experiencing the shared love and care and commitment and support that happens that I haven't personally seen in any other organization. And granted, there are plenty of failings that happen in the life of the church, just as there are in any place where there are more than one person gathered. But to see the way the church comes together to support and nurture and care for people, especially in times of conflict and crisis, is truly moving to me. I believe having that aspect of faith manifested in our life makes a tangible difference now. And then, of course, as Jesus is most pointedly speaking about here, about having life eternal, honestly, I don't know about that in the sense that, that I have not died, thank God. Um, and so none of us can really definitively say what it is that happens after this life ends. Now, it is my belief that for me, because of my faith in Christ, because of doing what I understand um, that Christ has called me to do, which is have faith in him and to continually accept that faith, 
that when I die, that I will go and be in God's full and glorious presence. And beyond that, what exactly that will look like, as it alludes to in the scripture, my mind isn't even able to comprehend. So because of that, I don't really worry about it. Now, what happens to those who don't have faith in Christ? I think this is the real key point and sticking point for a lot of people. What happens to the people who don't have faith in Christ when they die? I don't know. I don't. As it says in the Bible, Jesus sits on the judgment seat. Jesus sits in the place where the decisions are made about what happens in that. I know as a good friend of mine, a colleague of mine in Oklahoma would say, uh, he would say about himself, I don't have a heaven or hell to send anybody to. He's not the one who gets to make that decision. I'm not the one who gets to make that decision. I think far too often one of the real struggles and one of the real detriments that we have to the Christian faith is we like to elevate ourselves to that position. And that turns a lot of people off from the church. If I do know that Jesus is in the place where he makes that decision, I do know that Jesus is more gracious, is more forgiving, is more loving, and more accepting than I will ever be or any other person will ever be. I fully believe when I get to heaven, there's a hymn there, but when I get to heaven and I'm there in that moment, that there will be people who I am shocked will be there. And I hope and pray that's the case. So the question then really becomes, if that is the case, what is our responsibility? What's our task in the midst of that? I think for us, if, we, if we're going to consider ourselves followers of Christ, if we're going to take what he says seriously, then it's important for us, it's necessary for us to accept Jesus as our Lord and our God. And, and what that means in one aspect is to have Jesus to be the ultimate priority in our lives. That, that Jesus is the top and following him and living as he calls us to live is the highest priority. And if that is the case, then everything we do after that should fall in line with that. It should fall within the acceptable parameters of what would be permissible or encouraged by Christ. I mean, that's really what that means, to do that and to live that out. And so if we do that, then it would also follow for us that, that we would want to bring other people into that. If we understand being a follower of Christ makes our life better, has a true benefit to us, then we would want to share that with other people. A friend of mine who's a minister in Oklahoma as well would often say when he would talk to people about evangelism, which can be a really scary word, is that he would say, if I went to a restaurant and it was a new restaurant and I really enjoyed it and I really had a good time being there, the food was great, the atmosphere, the service, everything was wonderful, I would share that with other people because I enjoyed it. It made a difference to me. It was something that was good for me. So I would want other people to experience that as well. Hopefully that's what our life of faith is. If your life of faith is something for you that there is no benefit that you perceive coming from it, it's only a burden or a chore, reach out to me. You can find my contact information on the church website. Email me or call the church. I would love to talk to you about that so we can have a conversation about that. Not telling you why you're wrong or why you're missing something, but to be able to see what it is that, that you're struggling with or you're dealing with so that hopefully you can experience the healing that, that Christ wants for all of us in that and that to be able to move closer to him and to be able to experience that joy that he wants for all of us, which in all honesty is something that can be at times very hard to experience, especially with all of the difficulties that we are experiencing right now. Jesus loves us. God loves us. They want the best for us. If we remember what it says in verse 17, what Jesus said immediately after this, it says, Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. It's my understanding about God. It's my understanding about Jesus Christ. 
that they had no intention of doing anything that was done for the sake of punishing us, for the sake of casting anyone away into eternal darkness or pain or torment or whatever sort of mythology we have around that. That Christ came into the world and did what he did because of the love that God has, the love that Christ has, and because of love being both of their defining characteristics. May we see that as who they are. As we are continuing on the journey to the cross, may we see love being the foundation of all that is happening. And especially as the people of God, may we receive and respond to that love in all that we do. And that's what I believe this day. In the name of God, the creator, the sustainer, and the redeemer. Amen. Hear our prayer of confession. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world, for people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Let us uncover our sin before the liberating light of Christ. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess the folly of our sin and the hypocrisy of our complaints. We grumble about the evils in our world, even as we commit injustices and profit through this deceit. We fret about the scarcity of resources while hoarding Earth's goods and cheating the poor. We protest the problems of our world, but we do not actively work to address them. Merciful God, expose our sins before the light of your grace. Heal our sin and free us from our foolish ways that we may know the joy of eternal life in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we come to our time of offering this week, we remember that this Sunday we are lifting up and celebrating the United Methodist Committee on Relief, or UMCOR. If you would like to give to support that ministry, if you mail in a check, you can simply mark if you would like all or a portion of your check to go to that on the memo line. You can also do that as well through giving on our church website. There's a place to mark your special donation for that. But as we give today, we remember that we give not out of duty or obligation. We give as a response, as a joyful and generous response to the amazing and really unbelievable love that God and God in Christ have for us. So with that, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks because of your amazing love for us and because you provide for us in so many ways, some ways that we see and notice and celebrate and in countless other ways that we simply take for granted. Now at times there is frustration and even fear and anger because we don't feel like we have enough because there are others around us who have more. But nevertheless, in this moment, we give this portion back to you. We ask that you would bless it, that you would multiply it as only you can, that you would give us true commitment and contentment in what we have 
and that your work, that your kingdom would truly grow because of these efforts. It is in the mighty name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Thy rebuke hath broken his heart. He is full of heaviness. He is full of heaviness. Thy rebuke hath broken his heart. He looked for some to have pity on him, but there was no man, neither found he any. To comfort him, he looked for some to have pity on him, but there was no man, neither found he any to comfort. Him. Behold and see, behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto his sorrow. Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto his sorrow, behold and see if there be any sorrow. Like unto his sorrow. Because of God's love for us, we remember that God is more willing to hear our prayers, to respond to them, than we even are to pray. So with that, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you know our hearts, you know our minds, you know the struggles that we have in our day-to-day -day lives, and especially the struggles we have in accepting and following you. Gracious God, help us in these difficult moments. Help us in our doubt and our disbelief. Help us even in these moments when we might be in real pits of despair or suffering or in absolute times of rejection to still know that your love is there for us, that you love us not because of what we do or how well we do it, that you love us simply because we are May we respond to that love in gratitude by being willing to sacrifice of ourselves just as your son did perfectly for us and be able to share that joy and that love with others. And also knowing that in doing so, it helps us to experience and to be able to receive, to be able to be aware of that joy that you talk about being possible in our lives. As we gather, gracious God, we continue to remember all of those who are hurting, 
who are struggling with illness and waiting for a diagnosis or with joblessness or just sheer loneliness or despair. Gracious God, come to us wherever we are. Help us to experience your comfort, your presence, and your healing. And as your people, bring to our attention as well those places where we can be a part of it. Help us to remember that the way that you most often work in the world is through your people. So help us to be your change agents to truly help bring about your kingdom. And as we pray these things, we also join together praying the prayer that your son taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, and let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Before we have our benediction, I want to continue to remind you that today is UMCOR Sunday, and if you would like to support that ministry of the United Methodist Church, that you can do so through Glendale First. Also, we are continuing to have our sermon only video uh, and so if you have anyone in your life that that may not be in a place where they're ready to sit down and watch a full worship service and maybe they're wanting to know a little bit more about God or Christ or come to know a little bit more about our church I encourage you to share that with them through social media or emailing it to them or whatever means so that we might be able to help be that bridge for them to help them grow closer to Christ. And then finally, again, we are having our outdoor in-person worship services beginning again on Palm Sunday, March 28th, and then continuing after that. And so if you would like to attend those, you will need to sign up online and you can find information below and also on our church website. So with all of that said, as we go forth from this time, and whatever that looks like for you, we go forth remembering the amazing love that God has for every single human being that there is on this planet, that there ever has been, that there ever will be. May we, as the people of God, respond to that love and do so by sharing God's love in our words, in our actions, and in our deeds through all that we do. In the name of God, the Creator, the Sustainer, and the Redeemer. Amen.
Sunday lunch program um, is about local churches meeting the needs of people who are hungry. Some of them are homeless, many of them are housed, um, most of them are running short of money, at least by the end of the month. It's a community of people and a community of churches that's been working together since 1995. Sunday lunch is one aspect of our feeding program. It's a long tradition. We've been doing this for over 25 years. It's, it's an opportunity that I think so many of our church members have come to appreciate um, how it feels to give and how it feels to receive and how it feels to have some recognition of people in, in challenging, in, that fa who face challenges that are different than ours. My purpose really in volunteering is, is to serve the Lord and um, in this way I find out that uh, services to the a community in helping feeding the homeless and anybody out there that is needing a meal. I am Joylene Wagner. I coordinate the Sunday lunch program. I'm here to, uh, to encourage you to look at the website if you're interested in helping with the Sunday lunch program in March or on Easter. We will be serving all of those Sundays. You can go to the website glendalefirst.org and find the information there, find my contact information. It's also in the church directory if you have that. If you'd like to provide fruit, um, that, that would be great. And you could just let me know and we could arrange to pick it up or have you drop it off at the church. Um, we'd love to have you join in this effort.